reading uh, chapter 21 of Genesis, verses 1 through 21. We're actually only going to be doing 1 through 12. As I got further along in my studies and preparation, I realized that we don't, we're not going to be covering through 21. We're going to go through 12. So that's where we'll be reading. This is the Word of God from Genesis 21, verses 1 through 12. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old, when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned, And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. The word of God. You may be seated. And let's pray. Father, This passage, for those of us who have been following along, brings such relief. And Lord, you are a God who brings the fulfillment of your promises, who brings hope. Lord, help us as we look into this passage today by your Holy Spirit to be strengthened and encouraged, convicted, but most of all, to know you better and love you more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wiley College began classes two weeks ago. ETBU begins tomorrow. Marshall ISD begins their classes next week. I don't know when Carthage does. Have they already started, Steve? So they're still waiting, too. So in, 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 in honor of the education system that surrounds us, I want to uh, open with a couple of school-related jokes, especially since one of the sub-themes of our text is laughter. So do me a favor and laugh. First, summer vacation was over and little Johnny returned back to school. Only two days later, the teacher phoned his mother to tell her that he was misbehaving. The mother said, now wait just a minute. I had Johnny with me for the last three months, and I never phoned you once when he was misbehaving. (laughs) Thank you for that. And now for the college, uh, more of the college crowd. A sarcastic college professor, of course, not ETBU or Wiley or any of those around us. Think of a secular university. A a sarcastic college professor asked a class of entering freshmen, will all the idiots in this room please stand up? After a long silence, one freshman rose to his feet. Well, mister, do you consider, why do you consider yourself an idiot? The teacher sneered. Actually, I don't, said the student, but I hate to see you standing up there all by yourself. You know, we love to laugh, don't we? 
Laughter is contagious. Laughter is endearing. Laughter draws people closer. Laughter sedates emotional and spiritual pain. No wonder we like it. But there's also a kind of laughter that, that does just the opposite. There, it, it can push people apart. It can intensify emotional pain, especially for the person who is being laughed at. So there's a kind of laughter that marks joy and, and, and mirth, and there's another kind of laughter that marks skepticism and disrespect or ridicule or scorn. And as we've traveled through the Abraham history, the Abraham story, we call it the Abraham cycle, we've seen all of these kinds of laughter. It seems that Moses and God chose laughter as a sub-theme of Abraham's story. In our text this morning, uh, God's name, Yahweh, is the first name in the narrative. His absolute and perfect faithfulness is the first thing celebrated. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. That's what we're saying. That's not what it says. But God's faithfulness is, is celebrated. The, the, Hebrew of text, uh, the Hebrew text of verse 1 is, is in poetic meter in the Hebrew. Uh, although the translation, I don't know why, none of them that I found really bring that out, that this is poetry, verse 1. But it's, but it's also surprising what it says there. Why is it surprising? Well, because all along, as we've been going, we would expect this text to begin something like this. The Lord fulfilled his promise to Abraham. But that's not how it's introduced. Not only does it highlight God's faithfulness, but it specifically highlights his faithfulness to Sarah. Here's how it would sound in verse. In fact, it's in this, this is pretty much quoting from the ESV. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. That's maybe not to us a real attractive poetry to our ears, but in Hebrew, it was very poetic. It was poetic because it was the introduction to an important idea, the faithfulness of God and his faithfulness to Sarah. See, Sarah has always ranked in high in, in, in God's estimation. She has been just as central all along to the promise, just as central as Abraham has been. But do you remember the first mention of Sarah? In this Abraham cycle, it comes in Genesis 11, verse 30. I mean, besides the fact that it says right before that that she was the wife of Abram, then it was Abram. But the first thing we learn about her in any detail is verse 30 of Genesis 11. It says, now Sarai was barren. And if that wasn't enough, just to drive it home, it follows that with she had no child. Sarah's despair, Sarah's, Sarah's, Sarah's shame is what we know first about her. Finally, decades later, in today's text, her barrenness has been healed. The Abraham cycle in Genesis has all along been just as much about God and Sarah as it has been about God and Abraham. And arguably, she has suffered the most. So her relief is the greatest. She's relieved of shame. She's relieved of pain. She's relieved of a, an unsatisfied longing. It's the first thing we see in today's story. God ministering to Sarah. Well, our text this morning is also filled with laughter. No joke, but lots of laughter. In fact, laughter is the key word, a key word in the text. It, there's the repetition of the name Isaac, which means he laughs. There's Sarah's laughter at the birth of Isaac. Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Almost literally from the Hebrew, God has made Isaac for me. There's the laughter of those who would hear of it. 
Everyone, she says, everyone who hears will laugh over me. Again, literally from the Hebrew, everyone who hears will Isaac over me. But then in verse 9, there's that different kind of laughter. The mocking laughter of Ishmael, who with the birth of Isaac had been supplanted as Abraham's heir. So laughter, Isaacing, has been a sub theme all along. It, it shows up, first of all, in chapter 17. There Abraham laughed as the prom- at the promise of Sarah bearing him a son. It was a laugh of, laugh of skepticism, a laugh of cynicism. Sarah followed suit in chapter 18 when she overheard the Lord telling Abraham that this time next year she would bear a son. She laughed too. It wasn't the mirthful, mirthful laugh, uh, uh, ha, 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 but it was a you've got to be kidding me kind of laugh. So finally here in chapter 21, Sarah's laugh is a laugh of joy. A laugh of mirth. And and those who love her would join in her laughter. Her shame was over. Her longing has been satisfied. Laughter is a key word in the verses, and, and so are the words son and born. Each of those words appear, including laughter, each of them appear five times in verses one through seven. The 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 child of promise was born to Sarah and Abraham, and this is a miraculous birth. That's why it's reiterated. That's why it's mentioned twice of how old Abraham is. This is a miracle. God has visited Sarah. Many years later, we would hear of a virgin who God would visit, and she would become pregnant with a child of promise. More on that in a minute. Abraham and Sarah were long, long beyond childbearing years, and yet Sarah bore Abraham a son. Fulfillment of the promise that Abraham and Sarah would be a blessing to the, uh, would become a great nation, and they would be a blessing to many nations. That was now initiated, that fulfillment. Sarah's laughter, Sarah's laughter of mirth would continue through the ages, even to today. Well, let's relate that to Israel. As you remember, as you, as, if you've been with us, Moses is writing this to Israel as they wandered toward the promised land. And in the wilderness... If you're familiar with the story, which I think most of you are, in the wilderness, they didn't find very much to laugh about. And when they first approached the promised land, matters only got worse. There are giants in the land. They're terrified, and they want to go back to Egypt. There's nothing to laugh about, at least in the estimation of the Israelites. And if they did laugh, it would have been the laugh of, laugh of skepticism, of, of cynicism, of even of disrespect for Moses and for God. And why might Moses key in then on the mirthful laughter of Sarah and others at the birth of Isaac? Well, perhaps because in a way, Isaac's birth is Israel's birth. Lest they forget God is their God. They are his people. He loves them. He has covenanted with them to bless them. Moses reminds them that their status as God's chosen people is a great privilege. It it, it dignifies them among mankind. If they really thought about it, they would rejoice. They would laugh with mirth, not grumble. They would laugh like Sarah did at Isaac's birth. Because they too were born into the promise of God. But that goes beyond Israel. This goes beyond them. That mirthful laughter doesn't end at Israel. It continues through to that birth that I alluded to a moment ago. The birth of the son of promise. The son of the promise, Jesus Christ. He was also a miraculous birth, right? 
God visited Mary, a virgin. She became pregnant and gave birth to Jesus. And there was joy in heaven and among the shepherds. Great joy, great laughter at the birth of Jesus. And then fast forward to Acts chapter 2. The laughter rings even louder in the great expansion, or at least as loud in the great expansion of the church in Acts chapter 2. Joy, mirth, laughter. Just as Israel's birth came about with Isaac's birth, so does the birth of the church. All who belong to Christ by faith are God's covenant people. The promise has been initiated. Its ultimate fulfillment is sure. We can laugh along with Sarah. But do we laugh? Do we laugh with joy and mirth when we think of the church and our inclusion in it? Honestly, do we? I think we can get caught up in the cultural wind of the wrong kind of laughter when it comes to the church. More and more these days, our culture laughs in derision and disrespect at the church. And, and, and usually it's because, not because of, of, of something that is wrong in us, but it's because we love holiness, we love righteousness, we love the Beatitudes. Now granted, there are things in the church to mock, things, there are hypocrisies to point out, but, but that has always been true. We're here because we know it's true. We're here because we know Jesus is the remedy, the hope, in the midst of our sin, in the midst of our hypocrisies. Our journey isn't over. Our sanctification isn't complete. No one's is. But one thing is sure, it will be completed one day for everyone who is in Christ because we have a power, the powerful grace of the Holy Spirit working in us, living in us, just as sure as God is faithful and true. Look deeply, think, do a little self-examination. Do you scorn the church sometimes in your heart? I mean the true church, the one being formed by the Holy Spirit. Do you get caught up in the cultural wind of derisive laughter? Remember this, to laugh at the church is to mock the love of Jesus' heart, to mock his bride. I don't think we want to do that. I don't think we really honestly want to be a part of that. Jesus doesn't. He washes her. He patiently and lovingly sanctifies her. He cherishes his church. If Jesus can look with love and desire on his bride, the church, shouldn't we? Think about it. Search your heart. What is your attitude toward the church of Jesus Christ? Is it the laughter of derision because you feel in some way superior to her? Or is it the laughter of mirth because you are so delighted to be included? And just a little, one more thought. Uh, do we laugh with joy? Do we laugh with joy because Isaac's birth stands as an allegory of our freedom in Christ? Well, that's kind of an out there question, isn't it? And so I need to give you context for it. And the context for it comes in the second part of what we read in Genesis 21, but it picks up again in Galatians chapter 4. So if you, want to, if you have your Bibles and you want to turn there, turn to Galatians 4. I'm going to read verses 21 through chapter 5, verse 1. And you'll hear in this the, the resonance, uh, uh, the, the echo of what we read in Genesis in that from verses 8 to, to 12 with the Ishmael part. Actually, you'll hear the Isaac and the Ishmael part. Listen to this. Genesis, uh, Gal I'm sorry, Galatians 4, verses 21 through the first verse of chapter 5. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you listen to the law? 
For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and one by a free woman. There it is, right? There's Genesis 21. There's, there's the Abraham cycle. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the... Than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at the same time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So the promise was exclusive. Ishmael will never inherit with Isaac. And Christianity, likewise, is exclusive. Not even the most exceptionally pious law keeper will inherit the blessing. Only those who turn from their self-justifying ways, turn from their sin, put their faith in Christ Jesus, will receive the promise by grace. Let's consider how this bears out then in, as, we, as we take this passage and kind of unpack it into four different approaches, life approaches to this Galatians passage. First of all, there's the approach of law obeying, law relying. Law obeying and law relying. These are like the Judaizers who, who uh, Paul was addressing. They have faith, they have faith in Jesus, but, but they add the law to it as a means of justification before God. In fact, they press and say, you have to follow the law or your, or your salvation is not intact. It yields spiritual pride and self-promotion, but it also produces a profound pressure to measure up to a standard you can't measure up to. And it's truly slavery, slavery to the law. So that's the first one, law obeying, law relying. The second one is law disobeying, law relying. Law disobeying, law relying. These are people who know they aren't keeping the law, but they still cling to it consciously or subconsciously, as the means of justification and acceptance before God. Law disobeying, law relying. This can only lead to one of two things, and possibly both. Either it will lead to despair, I can't do it, so God won't ever accept me. Despair. Or, or, or it will lead to rejecting the law altogether for a manageable system of self-justification, which is what the next group does. Law disobeying, law relying. It's a, it's, a, it's a recipe for disaster. The third group, law disobeying, no law reliance. Law disobeying, no law reliance. This group rejects the law altogether, follows their own whims, their own appetites, virtually setting up their own system, their own law. They are self-justifying, they are relativistic. This, would, this is the world without Christ without faith. Some have a form of spirituality, but, but the danger is that their heart is deceptive. They, they might think they're in with God when in fact they're deceived. They laugh now, but their laughing will turn to weeping. It's the laugh of the perishing. Law disobeying, no law reliance. And then there's the fourth group. The fourth group can be described as law obeying no law reliance. Law obeying, no law reliance. So wait a minute, I thought, wait a minute, is that, this is the Christian perspective. Law obeying, no law reliance. This group represents those who are truly redeemed by grace. This is true Christianity. We have the law written on our hearts by the Holy Spirit and desire to become like Christ, but we know it's a process. 
We still sin, but we stand firmly rooted in God's grace so that we don't live under the pressure to try to measure up to a standard for our justification. Our justification is only in Christ Jesus, not by our works. And yet we long, we desire to live according to God's desire, expressed desire. We know that in Christ we're justified. We know that in Christ we're accepted by God. We know that the grace that saved us also transforms us. Galatians 3, 2-3. We know that our righteousness isn't our own doing, but the righteousness of Christ credited to us by, by faith. By grace through faith. We have been changed We are new creations, and we live obediently in the sonship of grateful hearts. So like Sarah, we can laugh in our relief and in our hope. This is the freedom that Christ brings. This is true freedom. When all is said and done, only the last group is free from slavery to sin and to the law. Even people in the third group, those who have rejected the law altogether, have replaced it with their own system of regulations and self-justification that they can't measure up to. It just becomes another kind of law reliance. So we can laugh. We can laugh along with Sarah and with Abraham. Admittedly, it's, it's hard to laugh in the midst of the suffering of this life. And, and let's be realistic. Some of that suffering is is self-inflicted, but much of it is suffering that comes from living in a fallen world. There are catastrophes around us. There are evils that affect us, not of our own doing. Add to that our own sin nature, which constantly battles against our new nature in Christ. It can be hard to laugh with authentic, mirthful laughter. And that's completely understandable. But we can do this. We can look deep down into the depths of our soul prayerfully. And there we can connect with the truth that uh, the truth of our place within the covenant of God's people. And we can meditate on that. We can reflect on our place within God's covenant people. We can imagine the mirth that, that, that we might feel because God's promise will not fail. He is perfectly faithful. And we can become aware of something that is profoundly true, even though at the moment the joyful mirth, even the laughter, eludes us. Romans 8, 18 says it well. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And then we can find that laughter. We love to laugh. Don't you love to laugh? There's a kind of laughter that marks mirth, marks joy. It's the laughter of Sarah at the birth of Isaac. God is faithful to his promises. God is perfectly and absolutely faithful to his promises. And in Christ, he will bring us to glory. Right now, we live in the midst of a time to weep and a time to laugh. Our weeping is legitimate, and yet as God's covenant people in Christ, we may also laugh with Sarah. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that in your word, you took a moment, Holy Spirit, to sing a song over God's faithfulness to Sarah. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and he did to Sarah as he had promised. Thank you for her laughter that has and will resound through the ages until now and continue to resound until Christ returns and then for eternity. Laughter, mirth, joy. Strengthen us, Holy Spirit, 
to endure the sufferings of this time, knowing that they don't compare to the glory that is coming our way if we are in Jesus Christ. Help us to laugh. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.